down. I want to thank everybody for coming. I know that there are many other things to be doing um, right now and to come to somebody talking about socialism and social change <laughs> instead of being out on the streets. I'm super honored um, that you're here. And I also wanted to thank um, Patrick Barrett, um, Tatiana Alfonso, and um, Aicha um, Zaye, right? Um, and everyone else who's been involved in helping um, this series happen. I want to begin by um, uh, saying, well, first of all, the title of my talk is Queer Theory, Socialism, and the Demand for Equality. And the theme of the series, of course, as you know, is renewing socialism for the 21st century. And here I take the podium in Madison, Wisconsin, scene of the most militant labor fight in the United States in decades, and the prompt for a boost in public class consciousness like we haven't seen in a long time. And so these events have challenged me to tie my remarks on the struggle for LGBTQ rights and liberation to the workers' struggle. I take the series title as more than a utopian gesture. Indeed, one of my main points is that radical ideas alone cannot usher in a new era of revolutionary politics. The fight for queer liberation is bound to every struggle for the emancipation from an economic system so grossly divorced from meeting human needs and so deeply invested in division, scapegoating, and the privatization of social responsibility. I'm a longtime activist and socialist, a labor and social movement scholar, and a media critic. My insights about all of these topics, though, are not only or even primarily generated out of academic work, theorizing, and so on. It's embarrassing to admit that, having been in the academy for so long. Um, over the past three years, since the passage of Proposition 8 in California, in California, I've been active in the LGBTQ movement in Austin, Texas, where organizations I've been part of have held rallies and marches. We built an alternative pride celebration called Queer Bomb. Um, and it was really important because like in many places in Austin, the uh, pride celebrations are organized, we, we all call it Gay Incorporated, right? Um, or, or like the Gay Chamber of Commerce, like we actually have a Gay Chamber of Commerce. Um, and so their rules, the, their rules this last June were no leather, <laughs> no dykes on bikes, no lanes, no nudity, no, um, um, <laughs> Yeah. Vinyl, what is that, what I'm trying to say? Um, no, um, and, and for some reason, oh, no, no trans um, persons at all. Um, no, no one dressed in gender inappropriate clothing, gender inappropriate clothing, and, um, and no bisexual people. That was the weirdest thing to me. And it just seemed to me that they were very interested, I mean, honestly, that's what the policy was. So they were very interested in, in, in putting out a line um, that basically said we have to fit very tightly into these categories and we have to prove to everybody that um, we are good citizens and, and we will um, dutifully shop. Um, so Queer Bomb <laughs> was an excellent expression and I want to come back to it in a little while because I, I think that there's a tendency in academic work and in activist work to fit sort of the more um, celebratory, um, um, fabulous, I don't know how else to put it, um, uh, performances, displays, um, being out there and in your face, to pit that against um, sort of traditional politics, right? And I don't think that we have to pit those things against each other at all. So um, so, so uh, remind me about the Gay Chamber of Commerce. Um, a group that I was in also took 140 Texans, 140 Texans, to the National Equality March in October 2009 to join the 200,000 or so who were there to press the demand for full federal equality. We had this awesome banner. It had a queer medillo on it. Um, <laughs> if you can imagine, I didn't, I didn't bring any images. I just wanted, didn't want to mess with technology, but it's an armadillo. And you know how they're banded, right? So it's rainbow banded armadillo. Um, and we made up a song um, about, um, based on the tune, The Stars at Night Are Being Bright, um, deep in the heart of Texas. And we sang it all the way down the road. It was. Um, incredibly awesome, and a, and a new generation of activists around me, and I think around all of us, was radicalized and inspired by that experience. Um, we've since then demonstrated against Don't Ask, Don't Tell, we've demonstrated for the Employee Non-Discrimination Act, and we have stood, as many of you have, I'm sure, in vigil for queer youth bullied and beaten into silence and suicide. It's fair to say, though, that the movement peaked in 2009 and is in a nationwide lull. We have seen the fruits of the movement in the court challenges to Proposition 8, the quiet reversal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell by the Obama administration, 
the quiet Justice Department statement against enforcing the Defense of Marriage Act, um, growing and growing public support for full equality. And I have no doubt that the movement will rise again in response to both victories and defeats. In tomorrow's lecture, I will discuss the history and legacy of Stonewall in informing the battles past and those to come. And today, though, I will discuss um, the ambivalent relationship of academic theories about queer liberation to activism. In my personal life, I have known and felt the stakes of these theories and these theoretical debates. My friend Courtney's partner is Costa Rican and cannot immigrate to the United States to be with her. Um, my friend Omar Lopez was hounded out of the military despite his award-winning service. He, um, he is a chef in the Navy. Um, he's now radicalized regarding the limits of liberalism and the Democratic Party, and he is not romantic about the military, but he wants his job back. My own partner lived apart from me and our daughter during, during our daughter's senior year of high school so that she could take a job with much needed and excellent health insurance benefits. Today she works full time only for the health insurance. Ironically, work may disable her, but I can't provide her disability benefits either. But this is not a sob story. It is a story about the need to fight back and about how that need may actually be disabled by a number of theoretical perspectives prominent on the academic left today. In what remains of this talk, I will make a case for struggles in the name of equality, specifically marriage equality, knowing full well that some cases for marriage equality and the integration of the military, for example, are conservative. The cover of Newsweek in December 2010 forefronted an article called The Conservative Case for Gay Marriage by a Republican Lawyer Named Ted Olson. And here is what Ted Olson wrote. Many of my fellow conservatives have an almost knee-jerk hostility to gay, toward gay marriage. This does not make sense because same-sex unions promote the values conservatives prize. Marriage is one of the basic building blocks of our neighborhoods and our nation. At its best, it is a stable bond between two individuals who work to create a loving household and a social and economic partnership. We encourage couples to marry because the commitments they make to one another provide benefits, not only to themselves, but to their families and communities. Marriage requires thinking beyond one's own needs. Um, and so on, conservatives should celebrate this rather than lament it. Now, um, I'm gonna make a case for gay marriage. Um, but my first thought upon seeing this um, passage in Newsweek was, wow, with, with friends like these. <laughs> um, but, and it, it just made me, um, this is sort of um, one of the main points that I want to make, which is that even though there are conservative cases for equal rights, that does not mean that all such cases are conservative. And some perspectives that proclaim their radical credentials may be more conservative than their proponents think. So the paper explores the approaches of academic left toward the actual movements for integration and equality. I argue that their utopian stances are distant from the movement for marriage equality while claiming to be more purely left-wing or radical than those who organized the grassroots October 2009 National Equality March. I structure my analysis of some of these perspectives based on the concepts of idealism and utopianism as they were developed by Marx and Engels. Then, I situate queer theory in relationship to the larger economic picture of neoliberalism, arguing that its post-identity politics are in some ways congruent with neoliberal imperatives. In contrast, historical demands for equality often press against their own boundaries to enable political movements beyond the confines of liberalism. I conclude with some thoughts on reform and revolution, arguing that it is short-sighted and politically disabling to eschew movements for reform of existing institutions in favor of anticipation of some imaginary um, future society where such institutions and the identity categories that sustain them are deconstructed. I will develop first a critique of the arguments of Judith Butler and Rosemary Hennessy on marriage equality. I structure my critique according to the arguments that Marx and Engels made of philosophical idealism among the young Hegelians and their critique of utopian socialists of the 19th century. Oh good, there's a flat space there. While I do not wish to negate the contributions of these theorists, I argue that Judith Butler represents an example of the problem of idealism, and Hennessy demonstrates characteristics of an unhelpful utopianism in her arguments against struggles for equality. 
Ultimately, I argue that their distance from reforms reveals a fundamental mistake of that of pitting reform against revolutionary aims. <coughs> Judith Butler in Gender Trouble and in much of her other work has pioneered the argument that heteronormative and unstable gender and sex categories discipline subjects <coughs> who are always enacting performances of gender to which there is no outside. Because her theory posits categories of thought about gender as the source of gender discipline, she cautions scholars and activists against articulating demands within the regulation of desire and kinship by the state. Marriage, she argues, is bound up with this regulation and with a constraining liberal imaginary. For example, in Bodies That Matter, she pro promotes, and I quote, the politi politicization of abjection, end quote and asserts that the political aspects of abjection could assist in, quote, a radical re-signification of the symbolic domain, de uh, deviating the citational chain toward a more possible future to expand the very meaning of what counts as a valued and valuable body in the world. Butler refers to abjection as an enabling disruption that could offer the occasion for a radical rearticulation of the symbolic horizon in which bodies come to matter at all, and again, a lot of that is I'm quoting her. Thus, for Butler, resistance to the gendered order on this theory does not involve collective mobilization in demand of recognition or redistribution, but rather the giving of new meaning to those persons and experiences previously unvalued. Next to this project, gay marriage appears to be a conservative demand. In an interview with the International Journal of Sexuality and Gender Studies, Butler stated, I am dismayed by the fact that so many national gay organizations have taken the right to marry to be the most important item for the gay political agenda. Of course, I am opposed to the homophobic discourses that oppose gay marriage, but I am equally opposed to ceding the national political agenda to the marriage issue. In the first instance, the pro-marriage agenda prescribes long-term monogamous pairs, um, and this breaks alliance with single people. This is kind of important. Hang on a second that people who are pro-marriage break alliance with single people and with alternative forms of kinship. It seems to me, and I'm quoting Butler at some length, to be a move away from a focus on AIDS. I object to the notion that having marital status is important for health benefits, since what we are saying with this argument is that those who are outside the traditional couple form are not worthy of health benefits. I believe we would not be so quick as a community to engage in this demonization if the specter of the decoupled individual with multiple partners were not unconsciously or consciously held to be the cause of AIDS. In other words, we leave the most vulnerable people behind in this current effort to make ourselves over as married couples. That's all, Butler. <laughs> I apologize. <coughs> I was a pariah on the airplane today. <laughs> All right. So, um, coming out of that passage from Butler, it is not clear to me how winning some rights for some people necessarily leaves others behind, um, uh, and especially those among the most vulnerable. But in an interview with Monthly Review, Butler said, if marriage exists, homosexual marriage should also exist. However, we must question the, f the norm of the monogamous couple, imagine more radical forms of kinship, reject the conservative effect of marriage as a regime of normalization that renders other forms of intimacy and kinship abnormal and pathological. We do not need a movement that does not win rights of some people. Wait, we do not need a movement that wins rights of some people over others. Here and elsewhere, Butler rejects the goal of reforms benefiting any particular group or subgroup. <coughs> In Berlin, in 2001, Butler criticized liberalism, as I would, and the struggle for rights and entitlements more generally as not interested in radical social transformation. She said, rights-based politics is very, very normalizing. <coughs> in a 2004 Nation forum, <coughs> Butler, at, when asked, are you for or against gay marriage, said, once one agrees to answer the question, one is already trapped and has lost the chance to ask, why has this become the question? Why should we ratify that priority over other priorities? What would priorities of a radical movement be if gay marriage were not monopolizing the agenda? Thousands of gay people forget, thousands of gay people forget 
their prior hopes for social movement that exceeds this demand for one legal right. They do not consider what social forms of kinship they are delegitimizing along the way." End quote. I would ask, now who is the they in that sentence? It seems to be a thoughtless, ignorant mass of gay people who have forgotten that they ever wanted more. The elitism of Butler's view is apparently um, is apparent elsewhere when she states that her lover is more Marxist, and which led me to write my margin, and really who wouldn't be, um, than I, and threatens divorce if I try to marry her. So there's this kind of refrain of more radical than thou because I'm rejecting reforms within liberalism. Other queer theorists adopt similar arguments against the demand for equality. Lauren Berlant and Michael Warner, for example, argue that marriage demands try to regulate non-standard intimacies into heteronormative logics and lead queers to settle for the system as it exists. In Trouble with Normal, Warner labels the demand for marriage complicit with the policing of the heteronormative social order. For Warner, the battle to be fought is not against capitalism or the state or um, uh, unjust laws, but against the dominion of normal. After this review, I'm left asking, does occurring one type of recognition foreclose on others? How effective a political strategy is the symbolic assault on normalcy, and for whom? And does it matter that today this demand emerges from a militant grassroots, the marriage demand, rather than being the polite request of a professional, conservative LGBT organization like the um, Human Rights Campaign? In my view, it takes a Marxist analysis to understand how radical the demand for equality in capitalism today can be. Now, Rosemary Hennessy is also a Marxist, and in her book, Profit and Pleasure, she emphasizes the role of homophobia and heteronormativity in buttressing the overall capitalist project of privatizing social responsibility. She is critical of Butler, rejecting the idea that the complexity of performed iterations of gender could be radical. Instead, she sees Butler's project as one in line with the proliferation of differences necessary to consumer culture. Hennessy criticizes postmodern avant-gardism that sees desire as the motor of transformation and excess as the source of human agency. And up until that point, I'm kind of on the same page. However, she, reject, she rejects marriage equality as a demand, arguing that this demand rehearses the anxieties and insecurities of the gendered social order and upholds the privatization of social responsibility and the oppression of women. <coughs> Her alternative is a politics of what she calls disidentification with gendered and kinship norms and the cultivation of what she calls revolutionary love, which sounds great. She writes, um, and I quote, disidentification is the practice of working on and unlearning the identities we take for granted, <coughs> denaturalizing and uprooting them. The disidentifying subject expresses outlaw needs that are affective, cultural, and ideological. The narrow resentment of ideology politics is replaced with a monstrous collective opposition of all capitalism's disenfranchised subjects. Now, while Hennessy's argument is closer to my position in her argument that we cannot get rid of existing categories of gender, while family uh, and the family, while capitalism remains in, intact, I, I believe that her argument is undialectical because it does not recognize how struggles for inclusion themselves bring challenges to capitalism and its ideological rationalizations. In addition, I believe that Hennessy's call for disidentification is unclear in its oper operationalization. What does it look like to unlearn in symbolic space outside of struggle? I suspect that academic work is the proposed answer, but capitalism cannot be undone by ideas. In short, I believe that the critique of demands for liberal reforms is disabling of our ability to think and act clearly against the imperatives of capitalism. Scholars who claim to be more radical than thou by virtue of refusing concrete rights in the here and now generally exhibit three political or philosophical flaws, political and philosophical flaws, in their arguments. Elitism, as noted already, idealism, and utopianism. Which brings me um, to a more um, systematic and less snarky Marxist critique of these philosophers. I have to say some of my snarkiness, um, and I'm not a very snarky person. I'm usually a very earnest person. But I ran into Rosemary Hennessy at a historical materialism conference, and I was so surprised when I heard her say 
that she wasn't for marriage equality. And I stood up and I asked her, I told her my whole story. And I'm like, are you telling me that you think that my family should be broken up for a year? You know, the prom and graduation, I mean, and everything, because there's no health care for my partner. And she said, yes. And I'm like, oh God. So, um, <laughs> that's her. Anyway, but, but, I, but there is, there is um, a, a theoretical critique beyond my own um, affront. Um, so, and it comes from Marxism. Um, Marx was a consistent critic of the idealism of left Hegelians, as many of you probably know. In the preface to the German ideology, he described the arguments of the Hegelians, the young Hegelians. Um, and, and this is a famous passage, and if you know it, just bear with me, okay? Um, Hitherto men have constantly made up for themselves false conceptions of themselves about what they are and what they ought to be. So he's ascribing this view to the Hegelians. This is not his view, okay? They have arranged their relationships according to their ideas of God, of normal man. The phantoms of their brains have got out of their hands. They, the creators, have bowed down before their creations. Let us liberate them from the chimeras, the ideas, dogmas, imaginary beings under the yoke of which they are pining away. Let us revolt against the rule of thoughts. Let us teach men, says one, to exchange these imaginations for thoughts which correspond to the essence of men says the second to take up a critical attitude to them, says the third to knock them out of their heads, and existing reality will collapse. I continue quoting, these innocent and childlike fancies are the kernel of the modern young Hegelian philosophy, which is not only received by the German public with horror and awe, but is announced by our philosophic heroes with the solemn consciousness of its cataclysmic dangerousness and criminal ruthlessness. Um, I just want to call your attention to um, Marx's characterization, uh, he's been listening to the young Hegelians and uh, say, let us liberate them um, from the imaginary yoke under which they are pining, let us revolt against the rule of thoughts, let us um, announce the cataclysmic dangerousness of new thoughts. And I cannot help but think of um, Judas Butler and Michael Warner. I mean, that's almost verbatim what they say that they are doing. So it's kind of interesting. Um, to kind of map that critique on. Um, and, and Marx goes on, one time, once upon a time a valiant fellow had the idea that men were drowned in water only because they were possessed with the idea of gravity. If they were to knock this notion out of their heads, say by stating it to be a superstition, a religious concept, they would be sublimely proof against any danger from water. His whole life long he fought against the illusion of gravity of whose harmful results, harmful results all statistics brought him new and manifold evidence this valiant fellow, fellow was the type of the new revolutionary philosophers in Germany. I wouldn't quote Marx at such length, but he really says it better than I could. I recognize the impulse to revolt against the rule of thoughts announced with solemn consciousness of its cataclysmic, it's hard to say, especially when I have a quote, cataclysmic dangerousness and criminal ruthlessness in both Butler and, to a lesser degree, Hennessy. We might also apply Likewise, Engels' critique of the utopian socialists to the work that I'm considering here. Um, Hennessy, for example, wants to leap over the struggle for existing, uh, for reforms within the existing system and refusing to settle for what can be done in the system as it presently exists. The idea of holding tightly to revolutionary love, um, it, an idea which is, I, I resonate with, is reminiscent of saint Simon, about whom Engels wrote, the solution of the social problems which as yet lay hidden in undeveloped economic conditions, the utopians attempted to evolve out of the human brain. Society presented nothing but wrongs. To remove these was the task of reason. It was necessary then to discover a new and more perfect system of social order and to impose this upon society from without by propaganda and wherever it was possible by the example of model experiments. These new social systems were foredoomed as utopian. The more completely they were worked out in detail, the more they could not avoid drifting off into pure fantasies. I should say um, that in spite, you know, in spite of this, this critique, Engels was also quite appreciative of the utopian socialists in terms of um, <clears throat> articulating a critique of capitalism that had not yet been <coughs> fully formed, um, but their faith in sort of model perform performative experiences and um, the intervention in the system of ideas, um, he found that to be um, foredoomed, as he says. So he concluded 
that socialism, if it were to be workable, needed to be put on a real basis. What this means is that one cannot conjure up a new society, but rather must work within and against the one that exists in the service of a future socialist society. As an activist and a socialist, of course, I am skeptical about the bourgeois nuclear family. Along with Marx and Engels, I adhere to an analysis of class society in which the first class society spelled the historic defeat of women, in which the gendered segregation of labor enabled the capitalist class eventually to divide and conquer and to displace responsibility for the well-being of society onto women, mostly in the private home. In an article on queer theory and family values, however, I also have argued that many tenets of queer theory participate in the logic of that privatization, which is also core to the economics of neoliberalism, the utopia of global capitalism. Like the kitchen debates of the Nixon era, y'all know what it was? Kitchen debates. Oh. So, what, somebody older than um, most of the students here, 1969 or something like that, um, uh, basically um, invited um, uh, Khrushchev and Russians over to see um, how great America was, and the, and the sign of how great America was was the vast array of appliances and homemaking tools that American women had access to. And so this visit um, actually came to be known as the kitchen debate and this display of sort of American affluence during the Cold War as, um, you know, this is why your system is going to fail because women have dishwashers. Um, um, but uh, I'm making an argument about the logic of this in terms of its politics of display and performance. <clears throat> It's weird to quote oneself. Um, <laughs> queer theory, like family values rhetoric, discredits collective political responses to social problems in favor of ludic or playful textualist strategies. It proposes utopian experiments in intimate fulfillment akin to the 1950s suburban ideal in lieu of a collective political struggle. Paraphrasing Nixon, to us, diversity, the right to choose, is everything. Now, the social relations of globalizing capitalism have required the relentless privatization of social responsibility from development discourse in which debtor countries become private agents in the world market to personal life where private families produce citizen subjects for the market. The privatization of social responsibility is an ideological and material maneuver, but the fight for reforms toward more livable lives is part and parcel of a program that assumes that revolution against neoliberalism cannot happen by thinking differently. Challenging heterosexist neoliberal norms ironically begins at home. David Harvey, I, I hear you've heard from him lately and that's rather intimidating, um, <laughs> argues that neoliberalism, and I quote, proposes that human well-being can best be advanced by liberating individual entrepreneurial freedoms and skills within an institutional framework characterized by strong private property rights, free markets, and free trade. The role of the state is to create and preserve an institutional framework appropriate to such practices. The state has to guarantee, for example, the quality and integrity of money. It must also set up those military, defense, police, and legal structures and functions required to secure private property rights and to guarantee by force if need be. the proper functioning of markets. Deregulation, privatization, and withdrawal of the state for many areas of social provision have been all too common. Almost all states have embraced some version of neoliberal theory and practices. Neoliberalism entails creative destruction, <clears throat> not only of prior institutional frameworks and powers, but also divisions of labor, social relations, welfare provisions, techno technological mixes, ways of life and thought, reproductive activities, attachments to the land, and habits of the heart. This is all Harvey. Again, so it's a very important social relations, ways of life and thought, reproductive activities, attachments to the land, and habits of the heart. Thus, neoliberalism is a utopian project with the political effect of reestablishing capital accumulation and power of economic elites. As in the present assault on public workers, planning and control are defined as an attack on freedom. This stance against state intervention and reform is disabling to the anti-capitalist left. Whereas liberalism depended on integration into existing institutions as a mode of control, 
Neoliberalism flourishes through difference, especially difference expressed in the symbolic domain. Contrary to a project that seeks justice, neoliberalism stands for anarchic freedom of the marketplace. There's a parallel between the rise of neoliberalism and the celebration of what are sometimes called new social movements. Harvey writes, the effect of such movements has been to shift the terrain of political organization away from traditional political parties and labor organizing into a less focused political dynamic of social movements across the whole spectrum of civil society. What such movements lose in focus, they gain in terms of direct relevance to particular issues and constituencies. They draw strength from being embedded in the nitty gritty of daily life and struggle, but in so doing, this is the point, they often find it hard to extract themselves from the local and the particular to understand the macro politics of what neoliberal accumulation by dispossession and its relation to the restoration of class power was and remains all about. So I, I maintain that postmodernism in many of its iterations stands in analogous relationship to neoliberalism in its resignation to the commodification of everything. For example, Leotard in his work, Libidinal Economy, which I think is very interestingly titled in the wake of queer theory, as described by Perry Anderson, who says, Leotard in this book went a step further to unmask the desire named Marx. A complete transcription was needed of the political into the libidinal economy that would not shrink from the truth that exploitation itself was typically lived as, in, as erotic enjoyment. Masochistic or hysterical delectation, I love that word, in the destruction of physical health in mines and factories, or disintegration of personal identity in anonymous slums, capital was desired by those it dominated then as now. Revolt against it came only when the pleasures it yielded became untenable and there was an abrupt, abrupt shift to new outlets. But these had nothing to do with the traditional sanctimonies of the left. Just as there was no alienation involved in popular investment in capital, so in disinvestment, there is no libidinal dignity, nor libidinal liberty, nor libidinal fraternity, just the quest for new affective intensities. Again, I know I've been quoting people at length, but I mean, I hope that you're hearing um, the linguistic um, resonance um, and the parallels among um, these ways of thinking. Um, the, the, the quest for affective intensities as a mode of resistance is also quite characteristic of queer theory. So let's return to the discussion about the queer critique of the demand for marriage equality and also um, about the integration of the military. Like the utopian socialist Pachesky criticized fetishization of bodies and pleasures and consumption in capitalism, but proposes a mental schema in response one that promotes disidentification with heteronormative institutions as political practice, like the idealist criticized by Marx. Butler seeks to knock ideas out of people's heads as a kind of political program. These ideas get expressed practically in political critiques of movements for equality. For example, in a book um, titled That's Revolting, which I think is interesting, um, one of the authors offers a witty critique of Chamber of Commerce gay elites but also concludes that assimilation is violence, saying it's the rat so writing, the radical potential of queer identity lies in remaining outside in challenging and seeking to dismantle the sickening culture that surrounds us. Um, this author also writes, the ultimate irony of gay liberation is that it has made possible, has made it possible for straight people to create more fluid gender, sexual, and social identities, while mainstream gay people sal salivate over state sanctioned Tiffany wedding bands and participatory patriarchy. Again, um, um, the um, elitism is, is, is troubling. Um, if gay assimilationists wanted actual progress, they started by, they'd start by fighting for the abolition of marriage and universal access to the services that marriage can sometimes help procure housing, health care, citizenship, tax breaks, and inheritance rights. Instead, proponents of assimilation claim that access to marriage will solve fundamental problems of inequality. Um, now, and all these people that I've been talking about, it's sort of as if one cannot imagine a politics of equality that is not articulated to conservatism or bound up with liberalism. And what I want to pose um, is that there is a third way, and um, not so shockingly, it has to do with linking the struggle for equality to uh, politics that challenges the capitalist system. So what we need is a socialist critique of marriage and the family plus 
the defense of integration into, into institutions that address working class gay and lesbian people. Um, uh, Bolshevik Alexandra Kollontai defined this third way against conservatives and liberals, um, sort of feeling assaulted by on both sides, um, and she wrote, the conservatively inclined part of mankind argues that we should return to the happy times of the past and, should, and we should reestablish the old foundations of the family and strengthen the well-tried norms of sexual morality. She is quite an experimenter herself. The champions of bourgeois individualism say that we ought to destroy all the hypocritical reactions of the obsolete code of sexual behavior. So on the one hand, you've got the conservative, nostalgic people, and on the other hand, you've got um, the, the the um, destroyers of the obsolete code of sexual behavior. And then she says, socialists, on the other hand, assure us that sexual problems will be settled when the basic reorganization of the social and economic structure of society has been tackled. She was not in favor of sort of waiting for the revolution to change. But one of the points that I make is, um, is um, that we can recognize, um, as Engels pointed out, that gay oppression is part and parcel of capitalism, and the introduction of socialist politics to the LGBT movement offers a way to tie uh, queer liberation to class politics beyond a matter of simple reciprocal solidarity or descriptive intersectionality, which dominate much academic writing right now on queer identity politics and, the, and class. There's a lot packed into that sentence, and I'm really sorry. Um, Just to <laughs> I will. I'm going to take it in parts, right? So, so basically, right now, um, we need to connect um, the politics of gay liberation to class politics, and there are a couple of ways in which that happens. One is in terms of reciprocal solidarity, which is great. For example, uh, a gay teacher I'm going to talk about tomorrow in Madison, recognizing that her union had supported um, her rights and had won her grievances and have protected her, and therefore, as a lesbian, she's going to go and support the union. So that's reciprocal solidarity, and that's awesome. Um, another way um, that this gets talked about is in terms of intersectionality, right? That it's just, you know, race, class, gender, sex, right? And that things are just kind of put together, and, oh, we haven't talked about class enough, right? Um, and that, I, I think that even though I would welcome um, people attending to class, and certainly welcome um, solidaristic um, demonstrations. I think we have to have a theoretical analysis that ties sexuality, sexuality in the family to um, the critique of capitalism. And so um, I, was, I was just reading um, the most recent issue or a recent issue of Sexualities, which is a special issue, arguing simply that class matters to sexuality and sexuality matters to class. Um, what is missing is an explanatory theory that does not merely gesture toward inclusion of oppressions in a categorical list. Marxist theory allows us to see how to inflect democratic demands in a radical class-based way. For example, the radical integration of public spaces, military schools, sports, and marriage deeply unsettled the basic assumptions and institutions of our society, leaving them forever changed. I have been influenced by Zilla Eisenstein, even though I disagree with her in the end, but she makes this argument in The Radical Future of Liberal Feminism um, about how uh, demands for an oppressed collective's inclusion in liberal society is always paradoxical. Because on the one hand, you're recognizing, um, uh, you're allegedly sort of affirming the state of things as worth being included in, but at the same time, you are recognizing structural inequality and collective oppression and exploitation. And so those two things um, are very explosive when you put them together. And she said that demands for an oppressed collective's inclusion in liberal society often stretch the limits of liberalism and point the way forward to something more radical that will burst out of this contradiction of seeking equality inside of a liberal framework. <clears throat> So I'm coming, I'm coming near a conclusion, and I'm sorry, I'm talking a little bit longer than I thought I would, but um, to abstain um, from these struggles, um, I would suggest, is like refusing uh, to participate in the freedom rides or sit-ins because demands for inclusion are conservative. Contrary to this point of view, I insist that it is not more radical 
to think beyond the logic of inclusion. Rather, it is alienist and abstract. The more radical than that postmodern condemnations of movements for equality make one final mistake, that of pitting reform against revolution. Rosa Luxemburg in Reformer Revolution excoriates Edward Bernstein for his idea um, of evolutionary socialism that could arrive out of piecemeal reform. However, she also argues quite clearly that one cannot jettison reform in the achievement of revolution. The relationship between these two is dialectical, not oppositional. And she wrote, reform and revolution are not different methods of historic development. They cannot be picked out from the counter of history among different factors in the development of class society as if one were choosing hot or cold sausages. I love that. She actually wrote that. Um, <laughs> and she's writing theoretical polemics, hot or cold sausages. These different factors condition and complement each other. Thus, Luxembourg argues that it is contrary to history to pit revolution and reform against each other. Political transformation requires both, and we can't leap over the on-the-ground social movements for reforms. Um, so in conclusion, um, summing up, uh, queer theory approaches to equality struggles are idealist and utopian, um, raising the question, what does it take to knock ideas out of people's heads? I put it to you that the answer to this question has echoed in the rotunda of your state capital. People's ideas, including Islamophobic, anti-union, and homophobic ideas, shift in struggle. Disidentification and performativity are inadequate responses that ironically mimic the logic of neoliberalism and fundamentally mistake the relationship between reform and revolution. Sherry Wolf in Sexuality and Socialism writes, gay marriage is a reform. Like all reforms under capitalism, it leaves the structure of the system intact while alleviating a grievance. In this case, the denial of both material benefits and the desire to have LGBT relationships acknowledged um, as equal to those of heterosexuals. Like the demand for unionization, under which the terms of workers' exploitation are renegotiated, equal marriage would end some discrimination mm -hmm. without eliminating oppression altogether. And so I say the, uh, this expectation that all movements for reform must meet somehow a standard of eliminating all oppression is completely unreasonable and that the left must stand unapologetically in defense of the right to same-sex marriage as with mixed-race marriage. One often finds that in winning inclusion in institutions as they exist means that those institutions and popular consciousness around them will never be the same. Perry Anderson put this problem in an interesting way. Rather than envision freedom as if capitalism were not reality, we must grasp this is his words, but it's really interesting. We must grasp the possibility of freedom from the realm of necessity. Struggling for rights and for the material benefits that come with them is the foundation of the struggle for broader free freedoms and justice. Of course, a world without borders and exclusions and universal health care are better. And of course, ending imperialist war is better than integrating the military. But in our actually existing world, we must stand with those <coughs> whose lives would become more livable if those goals were to be achieved. Many Marxists might agree with social theorist Jody Dean's description of democracy as it exists as a knot of hope and despair. I just, I just reread this the other day. To entangle that knot requires that one be in it, but it is also true without a, version, a vision of another kind of society, the will to work that stubborn, grimy knot from the inside may languish. So I will end by quoting Frederick Engels from On the Origins of the Family, Private Property in the State, describing what he conjectures the family or intimate life would be after the overthrow of capitalism. What we can now conjecture about the way in which sexual relations will be ordered is mainly of a negative character, limited for the most part to what will disappear. But what will there be new? That will be answered when a new generation has grown up, a generation of men who never in their lives have known what it is to buy a woman's surrender with money or any social instrument of power. A generation of women who have never known what it is to give themselves to a man from any other considerations than real love or refuse to give themselves to their lover from fear of the economic consequences. When these people are in the world, they, work, they will care precious little what anybody today thinks they ought to do. They will make their own practice and their corresponding public opinion about the practice of each individual, and that will be the end of it. Thank you. Well, I have, um, I guess this is a 
I think it's a comment, maybe it's a question, um, but I feel like it's of a piece mostly with what you're saying. But you know, when we were talking about um, Butler and I, I couldn't help but feel that to me there's this very strange disconnect where some queer theorists um, feel like the demand and the struggle for marriage equality is something that's dominated by liberal NGOs. Mm -hmm. And but from my perspective, one of my intense political frustrations in the last few years has actually been how reluctant liberal NGOs have right. been to take up the demand for marriage equality. Like, I had the kind of crazy experience, this was two years ago at Pride, um, of I was in Pride here in a socialist contingent that happened to be marching right behind the fair Wisconsin contingent, and some of our chants were about marriage equality, and their staffers were going around <coughs> telling everyone, don't do those chants, we're not chanting for marriage equality. And so I went and talked to one of the staffers about like why were they doing that, and he said, well, you know, what, like Wisconsin isn't there yet as a state. Like, that's not where public opinion is at. And I said to him, like, well, how do you think that public opinion will ever get there if we won't even say that that's what we're for? And I, I guess what, what I was thinking while you were talking about this is I feel like what's maybe the shared political premise here is the idea that America is just sort of irredeemably conservative, or like most America is, or working class Americans are, or, you know, something like that. And so then your choice is like, you either try to endlessly craft your message to this like imagined conservative block, or you just kind of reject that and say, I'm not dealing with that, I'm going to do something better by myself. But I guess I feel like the, I, you know, I, I guess where I want to maybe push you and, and all of us in the discussion is when you were talking about like going beyond kind of simple solidarity, like what does that actually mean? Because one thing that I've been thinking about that is I was just really affected by listening to the testimony in the Capitol um, because I felt like when people were talking about like how is this bill going to affect them, Walker's bill, like I felt like what you were watching happen sometimes at least was like people's personal stories being kind of transformed into understanding this isn't just what's happening to me personally, this is part of a larger attack. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering about like the role of personal stories in being, you know, not just a kind of like simple solidarity, but actually expressing something really profound about like the scale of, you know, of what's happening in politics being like the super rich splitting off from all of us, and then, you know, you telling your story about your partner and the health insurance, uh -huh. like, you know, that that kind of resonating with the supposed conservative block in a different kind of way because of what people are experiencing. So I don't know if that comment made a lot of sense, but that was. I think hopefully uh, uh, people should, are, are, don't expect me to answer it. <laughs> answer each other. Eric. Um, my comment was not everything's connected to everything, but it is a response <laughs> directly to what Elizabeth was saying. Um, let me add it to the soup for the moment. It has to do with the utopian moment. And <clears throat> as you may know, uh, the moniker I've used to describe my grappling with this problem of socialism is real utopia. Uh -huh. Meant to be an oxymoron, of course. But to take seriously the utopian part, not to just make a joke. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not saying you were making a joke, but the, the real utopia is not meant to be just a puzzle. Um, even Marx, in the course of his life, became more friendly mm -hmm. to what in his early years he called little experiments that would never amount to anything. His view in the uh, his uh, famous inaugural address to the international about worker cooperatives were that these were giant experiments that showed the possibility that workers could actually do things on their own, but that they would hit limits that they couldn't transcend. Mm -hmm. yes. Right? And so what it's true, the early utopian socialists weren't attentive to this problem of limits, and that was a problem. But the models which they attempt to build and the attempt to build alternatives in the here and now to demonstrate in a prefigurative way the reality of alternatives, I think has to be part of our conception of strategy. Uh, it's a little different from reformism, although it has a kindred relation. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's actually the place where I think sexuality issues and LGBT movements and so forth actually do have a really distinctive thing to do. That is, they are building alternative relations 
in the space as possible in the existing world. And if the egalitarian premise of full inclusion and equal access of all people to the social and material conditions to live flourishing lives is actually taken seriously, it is inherently anti-capitalist. Yeah. I mean, an a, a truly egalitarian marriage program is an anti-capitalist one. Because the egalitarianism that's being represented by it means an egalitarianism of people's capacity to live a flourishing life, and capitalism blocks that. So it's not just I don't think you can jump over it. I think it's part of the process of moving beyond the present. Even if you, you know, so it, the, the fantasy jumping over is that you, you can't build a future without building things now. That's you know, just not how futures are. I hear you on that. Um, and I, I, might, I might come back around on that, but why don't you go ahead, Patrick? Well, I, I, in some ways, it kind of builds on what Eric was saying, because I had a couple of thoughts about this. One is that the way in which you've described marriage, it's to, maybe it's an unfortunate way of putting it, the utility of marriage under capitalism is that it enables people to take part in uh, certain benefits that are not available to them otherwise. So if it, if it were the case that we had um, socialism in which everybody was well taken care of, uh, you wouldn't need marriage in the way you described it in your talk and in referencing your own personal situation. And the reality, it seems to me, that there are actually forms of capitalism currently existing, say, Scandinavian social democracy, where people are well taken care of in the ways that you see are, are lacking currently under American capitalism. And in fact, uh, marriage is a less common phenomenon. Um, w women and children are much better taken care of in general. Um, and people overall are better taken care of. And so there's less of a a drive for, for marriage as a useful thing to meet those kinds of needs. Now on the other hand, I'm thinking about it also building, I think, on what Eric was talking about. That when, since you posed this thing about revolution versus reform, the reason I've always been attracted to this notion of non-reformist reforms mm -hmm. is that not all reforms are the same. And that some of them actually at least offer the promise of doing a couple of things. One is that on the basis of winning the reform, they create the possibilities for moving further. And in the process of winning them too, the very mobilization and the political work that's done, it creates the possibility of moving forward. So I'm, I didn't really hear in your presentation what it is about this specific reform, the fight for marriage equality, that lays a better foundation for fighting for equality overall in a form of socialism, perhaps. Um, so I didn't hear that. And I'm wondering, what is the specific way in which the fight for marriage equality is a non-reformist reform in that sense? Mm, I think that's a really interesting question. And uh, just to kind of tie some of this together, um, I'm cognizant of, of, this, um, of this issue about sort of positing marriage as sort of a utilitarian thing in the absence of broader um, social welfare, welfare measures. But I was also reminded, um, I was just reading um, James Meredith's account of um, trying to attend the University of Mississippi. And so, but I need to be active in the movement. And the years always escape me, but somehow the year 1962 is in my head. Um, I could be really wrong about that. But he traveled by train to the north and then on the way, and, and, and uh, in the north, the trains were not segregated. But when the train came south again and they hit Memphis, um, he was required to move to a different car in the train. And he said that he wept all the way from Memphis um, home. And so it wasn't that the seats in the other car were worse. <laughs> you know what I mean? It wasn't really about the train. Um, and in, in a sense, marriage is like that too for a lot of us, and for me too. Um, it's, it's not really. Um, about um, idealizing um, the reform, uh, but just um, the power that it would have um, in terms of our own um, rehumanization and sense of, of agency that I think could only help um, organizing for broader struggles. Um, and then I, and I was thinking a lot also about interracial marriage and the 
a loving decision and, and how Virginia Loving was um, through a lot of weight behind the marriage equality struggle um, and how that, you think that that's a simple reform, but it just blew the doors off, you know. Um, and, and likewise with in integrating the military, I know I'm rambling, but I mean, it's one of those things when you integrate some of the more conservative institutions on a collective basis, um, I, I, really, I really do think that that's kind of part of what makes a non-reform reform or a kind of um, revolutionary integrationism, if you will. Um, and I totally agree about fights for reforms can totally build um, consciousness and, um, and organizations that can move beyond those particular reforms. And I've definitely seen that in the marriage equality movement too, although we're in a lull. I'm going to talk about the movement more um, tomorrow. Um, the role of the utopian, I mean, it's kind of why I ended with Engels, right? Because I mean, I feel like we have to kind of know I mean, what we're fighting for. Um, but also recognize that cooperatives, um, little, you know, unclaved experiments. I mean, Michael Warner is just all about not fighting the system, but um, celebrating um, queer spaces uh, for public sex parties, um, um, for, for the expression of non-standard intimacies, which is what he calls it. And there is a utopian dimension to that, but I can't see that version of a utopia connecting um, to anything um, um, productive in the long term. And I think that Accepting that as the framework for liberation, it can really only apply to a, a small layer of people. Um, let's stop. Yeah. I was going to make a comment about um, the marriage equality and the your connection between law versus Virginia mm -hmm. and how that is pertaining to the new marriage equality mm -hmm. right now. I think that's a great connection. Mm -hmm. I mean, I see many coalitions between the two. And on how you can argue that um, interracial marriage was the last step towards final equality for blacks um, in, the 19, in the 1960s. Um, that was the ending point of where you know they finally were able to you know, like, this ending right that kind of stuff that kind of stopped most of the separation between the two races. And I I really like to make that connection between marriage equality now. I think that would be the final that be one of the final steps to achieve sexual equality in the United States. Um, now, my question for you is, uh, you offered at the end that reciprocal solidarity would be a way to achieve marriage equality. Mm. However, oh, all right, I might be, I might Go be, ahead, go ahead. Um, this is quoting, but um, my question is, in, in the United States where the, where the ring, where the battle is defined by legality and basically defined by the United States Supreme Court, um, how can reciprocal solidarity um, be a factor in a society where it's completely defined by legality and where something stronger such as suspect classification would do more than solidarity with other groups. I'm not sure I entirely understand your question. My, my question is, for the way that I understood it was that you proposed through reciprocal solidarity as a way to achieve marriage equality. Mm. Uh, Go ahead. I mean, but, but the second part. What are you seeing? What 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 for you is the problem with the law and the limits to solidarity? That's what I'm not getting. I don't see. I don't see the limits. I don't see solidarity as a key aspect in gaining the legal the legal battle. Oh. In winning the legal battle battle for marriage equality. I see. So yeah. On the one hand, I I. I um, get excited about solidarity um, uh, among different struggles, but I was also kind of critical of that. Um, and I'll come back to that in response to Elizabeth's question too. But I think in response to what you said, that I would want to point out that historically there's an enormous connection between industry social movements and what happens on the legal front. No, even the lawyers and politicians will tell you that sort of it's a rarefied discourse and those, you have to, you know, um, jump through those hoops and do that, um, and, and that that's not um, the whole separate domain from social movements, from and everything from um, Roe versus Wade to 
um, any number of other court decisions, which are flying out of my head, um, that, 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 that um, massive um, pressure and mobilization were very important, and, and therefore the garnering of um, solidarity across difference and across movements was really crucially important. It was so cool last Saturday or two Saturdays ago in Austin. Um, we had two labor rallies in Austin, and I gotta tell you, um, we haven't seen that. I mean, I've been in Austin for 18 years. Um, I've been to some big rallies, but um, on Monday night, right after, I forget which date it was, I'm like, <coughs> um, 2,000 people came out at, to the AFL-CIO Hall, which was just astounding, right? Um, in Texas, right, to work state. We don't even have really a union, you know, um, anywhere. And then on the Saturday, the Saturday of the national call for protests and solidarity with Wisconsin, uh, we had the pro-choice march was in the morning, um, and um, the, the solidarity march was in the evening. Um, activists rallied the pro-choice people to march to join the labor gathering, and they all changed their signs. <laughs> um, and the way that they changed their signs, and this gets back to Elizabeth's question, was to recognize um, that there's a system, and it's the same people that want to restrict um, women's access to abortion, um, so closely connected to um, the attack on public workers, because it's all about the private family, and about the discipline of the family, and about that is the locus where we take care of our people. The state should not take care of people. And so public teachers, public schools, um, public services, um, which are being gutted right now in Texas also, um, uh, that, that there is just a clear line between those um, issues uh, and, and labor uh, and, and, and uh, women's reproductive rights and LGBTQ uh, liberation. I mean, that it's part and parcel of the system. This, and so I think it, for me it all comes back to the Marxist analysis of the privatization of social responsibility. And, and so more than simple like, you helped me, I'll help you, which is good. Um, but a way, a politicization of the struggle so that everybody can kind of understand that there is a system problem and that it's the same system um, that is um, um, ruthless in its um, slashing and burning of any public responsibility or accountability at all. Um, so. And all of that depends, not all of it, but a large part of that depends on upholding this idea of the family as a haven, as a place where people take care of each other. Um, and um, I'll talk more about that tomorrow. Also. I actually had a thought about Patrick's question, because I think it's a, a, a very um, important question. But one thing I wanted to throw out there is I feel like we didn't choose marriage equality as the mm. terrain, the right did, you know, and that with, um, with you know, the, the Defense of Marriage Act, you know, actually not just the right, the Clinton administration, but then following that, the whole series of state level attacks on the right to marry, that to me that's part of why marriage equality is a, the phrase you used was non reformist reform, or, or it is a fight that could generalize much beyond kind of what it seems like is contained inherently in the demand, because I feel like it is one of those avenues where you're saying like, oh, you're gonna try to take this away, well, we're gonna actually not just defensively respond, but make that into a, an offensive claim about a positive right. I, I think you could make just one other distinction here. You can talk, some reforms could be called disruptive reforms. Say that again. Disruptive uh -huh. reforms. But they don't, in and of themselves, open up more space for future advances of equality, but they do disrupt an equilibrium where certain kinds of definitions are taken for granted. But they could result in a, in a reestablished new equilibrium, which would constitute barriers. So if the result of marriage equality is a restabilization of the nuclear family, just now a more diverse type of nuclear family, which was equally consumerist and privatized, 
if that was a new stable equilibrium, then it would have accomplished something. You know, it's still better to live in a world with nuclear families and marriages that allow same-sex marriages in the world without, but it would not have been a non-reformist reform in the sense of opening up a space for further democratic and egalitarian. But the disruptive aspect of it, in that process of disruption, the deeper questions of equality and of equal access to the social and material conditions to live a flourishing life, of which this then is one instance, that deeper problem is in play when it isn't where it wasn't before. And so that disruptive aspect is what I think opens up a space which can get lost, you know, and that's why combining it in the very process with these broader demands is, I think, what then renders it a non-reformist process. I don't know if that's clear, but... Um, I lost you at the end. Well, it's the fact that now, while you're struggling for this, you say, what we really care about is a world in which all people have equal access to the social and material conditions to live a flourishing life. And this is one of the points of contention around that problem, that's the bigger problem, is equal access to the social and material conditions, in this case social conditions especially, to live a flourishing Well, it's what Dana was saying, is the way I interpret it, is that it opens the space for reflection and connecting dots and seeing things in a broader systemic way. Um, if it's narrowly confined to this is our an end in itself and this is all we care about, and it doesn't commit, it isn't accompanied by the, that broader reflection and connecting of, of dots, then it's less transformative. And so on the extent to which um, um, a, working class, a working class is driving the movement, right? I mean, that, that um, any time you disrupt sort of the norm of a, of a private, procreative um, family, I mean, yeah, that's a disruptive reform, but it's not, I don't, I don't think it would turn into that sort of limiting, I mean, they're not going to, I mean, working class LGBT persons are not going to become crate and barrel shoppers by virtue of getting married. You know what I'm saying? Like, the whole, the whole embrace of the kitchen debate culture is, um, so that vision of what um, family is like and what family is for, I mean, it could be articulated, um, on a class basis in a way that would not foreclose upon its um, radical potential. And I'm, I'm afraid of having like a, a Franz Fanon moment. I'm having a, an existentialist moment, not even a Marxist moment. I'm having a, like, um, um, de about dehumanization and rehumanization and agency. I mean, I think marriage is just one of those things where, um, on the one hand, it's a conservative Thing is, it's articulated in capitalism, but the, it's a slap in the face to be denied um, that right because it is so much about what the, it's. A, it's one of those touchstones. It's one. It's about what it means to be a person. I mean, to have adult relationships, to to constitute yourself in um, society. And I, I don't think we have to conceive of marriage in the, like a, the way that that lawyer that I started out with does, but. Just to be told, whenever I see someone and I'm, and I'm petitioning or whatever and they say I'm not for marriage equality, I feel like they didn't say that. I feel like what they said to me is, you are not a person. Right. Um, and that um, is what James Meredith, I think, was feeling <coughs> on the train. And, and so that, for me, is, is deeper than um, any of these queer theorists are going to recognize. Hi everyone, thank you. Are there any other librarians in here? Represent. <laughs> All right, um, I am doing a library of science, gender studies, women's studies double uh, masters, and it's hard to describe, you know, explain to the uh, library of science folks what's connected. But one of the things that I struggle with and enjoy thinking about is um, why I'm here is to think about how I'm going to bring new voices into the mainstream and make, have intuitive categories, but transformative categories. How do, we make, how do we mainstream people and mainstream and expand the discussion without you know, causing the same problems, which is very much like what we're talking about in terms of organizing. You know, that the, the line between you know, putting people, putting stuff in the same categories, and we're literally writing the categories now. 
So it's really hard to take it and go, the, you know, take the theoretical and actually, you know, write down the Library of Congress. I was wondering if you could help me describe what you're saying and bring it to the bring it to librarians about these, you know, in a much simpler way than you know Butler. Just kind of this. I mean, it's so it's so difficult, but it's. I want to bring these issues in, and I, I, I'm wondering if you could do what these. issues exactly do you want to Well, just kind of talking about the contradictions and the difficulties and the tensions between a diversity of voices and naming categories and, um, you know, and how to doing it really intentionally and allowing people to name themselves at the same time keeping these familiar categories and structures so folks can find it. Oh, I'm not sure that I can explain it better than you just did in a simple way right now. I do recommend if you're interested in sort of bringing that system analysis of sexual sexuality issues, um, that Sherry Wolf's book is just so clear. It's much clearer than um, what I said. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> um, it's, um, she has, um, she's, I'm not going to say that. Um, <laughs> I think she is sort of rightly less patient um, with some things. Um, what was the title again? Well, sexuality and Socialism. And it, it goes through a lot of things that I think would be very direct and helpful. Um, first, I have a question. What was the name of the culture that you had? Oh, Alexander Collin. Okay, I don't know. K-O-L-L. K-O-L-L. A-N-T-A-I. O-N. O-N-T-A-I. Colon time. Sorry, K-O-L-L-A-N-T-O. Oh, okay, O-L-L-O. Okay, sorry. N-T-A-I. It's getting it's getting written. It's one of those weird things when you start trying to spell. Five hundred ways to spell that. Alexander, you know, and it being International Women's Day, and really important that she was definitely one of the biggest advocates of celebrating the day when Russian women. Demanding bread and peace spark the February Revolution. Um, I, my, um, I guess my larger question, I think a lot of people's questions can be sort of about um, terminology and how we um, talk about these um, issues. Um, I mean, for me, the sort of like gut intuitive thing was saying with these sort of reciprocal solidarity thing, the thing that comes to mind um, for me is a, like oppression, you know, and we're like, standing against. Profession or something like that. Those are sort of the things that come to mind. I remember reading some Kotsky at one time, and he was talking about we need to eliminate oppression in all forms, and that's our struggle. It's not. It's not necessarily socialism. That socialism is this, or the, or the struggle of the working classes are are, are the right for mm -hmm. um, struggle right now, or things like that. But that it's you know oppression is this larger thing, and that sort of you know hits home in a certain way. But at the same time, when I have conversations with um, a lot of my friends, say at the rally at the Capitol, we talk about um, you know, LGBTQ, or you know, I'm not even sure mm -hmm. the ways to, to talk about these things, or even mm -hmm. um, women's rights and the struggle of women. And I feel like at times, you know, we sort of um, maybe mm -hmm. I want to say that it's all, you know, we're all against oppression or something like that. And that's the thing that we can not against. Or even like you said, that it's, there are really class things that can be brought in um, to a lot of arguments that we think are maybe just social or, or personal things for certain groups of society that are really <laughs> much larger than we realize. Um, but you know, like when I when I talk to some of maybe maybe female friends and they say, to some extent it's almost like you don't understand or you don't understand the the significance of this struggle in particular, that it has its own sort of it's not the same necessarily as uh, a race issue or a you know, sexuality is, a, is something like they have their own special characteristics, which I would say is, um, you know, we have to acknowledge at the same mm. time the same, the, their um, sort of personal nature of the and the independent nature of the um, uh, struggle. So, I guess, you know, what I'm I, I read an article by uh, George Lakoff recently um, about uh, um, conservatives and what is conservatism. Yeah. And that it seems, but 
the way that he was writing about it, it maybe a bit too broad, but he, he really, um, I think he's okay with saying that conservatives aren't such, and that they're, and, and that this is the conservative values, and, and that they can say things like family values, and just, and really rally behind that as a gigantic group. Um, but what are the sort of terms, and it seems like, what, and, and what he said what he was that the, the right, and he, he can use his, I don't mean to distill this to right-left politics, but he had said the right has this gigantic, basically, a propaganda mechanism, and some of the terms that he used, but they're very good at um, phrasing things, and they're really on top of their game when it comes to um, giving their, you know, movement, if that's what you want to call it, the, uh, or uh, that um, terms to use and things that people can get behind, um, and that the left is not really doing that, though, or, or at least, you know, if you want to say Republicans, Democrats, Republicans who can do that better than Democrats to the extent that they are right and left. But um, uh, anyway, I guess one question I have is that why does it seem so difficult for the left to, you know, I, I wouldn't, I'm not advocating for some sort of propaganda department of the left in general or whatever, but that, that why is it so hard for, um, you know, maybe the left to, to create this sort of terms and to rally around things that seem sort of intuitive, whereas you know, oppression seems sort of intuitive to me, just as maybe family values might be intuitive to a you know, uh, conservative or something like that. It's a big cluster of questions. Um, I personally think that the left should make as much propaganda as, as it can. Of course, I mean, we're stymied by the lack of access to the platforms of the seven major corporations that control all of the world's small media. Detail, small detail. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, what we have instead, I mean, it is remarkable after sort of Egypt and Wisconsin and say those things together, yeah. it's really fun, um, is um, that, um, that uh, suddenly more than 60% of the American public is for collective bargaining yeah. and wants to defend teachers and public workers. And you're just like, how did that happen? That didn't happen because relentlessly we got up and said, here are our values, although these are our values, right? Um, but that um, when, people, when people are struggling um, and the definition of democracy gets expanded and challenged, that, um, that that's where our message can come in. Um, about, but then there's a lot of work to be done in terms of extending the struggle. I mean, what's going to happen here? And I mean, I'm interested to know what people think is going to happen here. Um, the taxi driver that I was riding with this morning was like, "Oh my God, we can't lose this." And I'm like, "Yeah, I know, we can't lose this. But how, what 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 will it take, you know, <coughs> to win?" And it would be a victory for everybody, and that's something I'm very interested in. So more propaganda, more in agitation, more information, more messages. Um, the other question that you had was about sort of uh, recognizing the specificity of different oppressions while at the same time building solidarity. And I think that even though a lot of queer theorists will say those things are at odds with one another, I've never understood that argument. Um, that there is no reason why um, a mass organization ha will silence or suppress or undermine any of its diversity in the making of a demand. I mean, that it seems so, um, personally, I think someone has to have not struggled. I mean, not have not actually been part of a mass movement, um, which is what I worry about with some of the theorists. I mean, to, to know that you work this stuff out in practice, and if there's an issue, people will tell you, you know, but um, the main point I was trying to make was that, um, you know, difference can flourish and a unity of purpose can flourish if we understand um, our common enemy, um, our common, uh, the structure that is basically um, using those divisions to divide and rule. And um, I think, I think yeah. you can say it more positively too. I think really fundamentally it's the same value. Mm. It's not. It, That's what I was going to come back to. It's really the same values. So, um, I think Lakoff is completely wrong mm -hmm. that the right has an easier task at the level of language. It has an easier task at the level of resources. Mm -hmm. That's right. But the values, the symbolic work, the words that we use to capture for values, solidarity, uh -huh. 
uh, democracy. So now people know what that equality. means all of a sudden. You know, solidarity, democracy, equality, caring, you know, the, mm -hmm. uh, uh, social responsibility mm -hmm. as opposed to, these are resonant ideas. Yeah. Uh, but we don't have the same kind of platform to articulate their interconnection and their presuppositions. And they're also, um, I think, the, found, the foundations that are the commonality between struggles around race and class and sexuality and gender and disability. Uh, I mean, all of these things before <laughs> have to do with uh, creating a quality of access to the conditions for the flourishing life. Right. Right. And the social and material obstacles to that. Now, the fact that the, it's not, it, it, it's, that's where the deepest commonality is, more even than the nature of the enemy, because there are different, so to speak, specific tar enemies so, mm. that are fighting against particular points of that. Even if it's a more abstract claim that they're all the same enemy. You know, the, the evangelicals are not the same as <clears throat> Citibank, even if they have some, even if they have connections which we can as diagnosticians that really thought about it, say yes, they're really part of the package. Um, but the common values, I think, are, are right there. I agree, but I think that we can't win on the vision. I mean, I think that in periods of quiescence, the, that common sense is not on our side, you know? And, and, and I think that, which is not to be horribly pessimistic, but is to say that, um, that organizing and that makes organizing for reforms ever that much more important. I did see a bumper sticker in the parking garage yesterday. I was driving and I passed a car and it had a bumper sticker and it said, I'm a values voter. And I'm like, oh. And I looked at it, it's like, end the wars, um, <laughs> you know, total free health care now, you know. Um, and so I thought that was exactly kind of what you were getting at. But, go ahead. I, well, I think it's really interesting is that this particular governor has used, the two of the phrases that he's used more often than not have been shared sacrifice and haves versus have-nots. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so he's appealing to the sense that people have of fairness and all of that, but he's manipulating it in the most crass possible way. And that's populism. Um, and it, I mean, all of these right-wing people re appeal to democracy and freedom and all this stuff because they know that that resonates with freedom people. Freedom more than democracy. And diversity, yeah. they take in diversity. But freedom, <coughs> the, the language of democracy and the language of equality are much tougher for the right to really appropriate. They do try, but they're, they're on shaky. But only in the liberty, it's only on the liberty side of democracy, you know? Right, yeah, it's the freedom side. Like, yeah, like, like um, Chantal Mouffe, I mean, in terms of diet and, and Jeremy Dean, the, the democratic paradox, right? Like, I mean, the only reason uh, that it's a paradox is because of capitalism, right? Because we cannot have complete liberty and equality. I mean, that that, that would require some measure of social intervention. And um, there's somewhere I was going with that. It was a good comment anyway. But the, yeah. the, but the whole <laughs> thing around Iraq was about democracy. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. You can say that until the Middle East starts having its own role. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And some of the people are so much less Islamophobic, you know what I'm saying? I think. Coming out of, well, eight years ago, coming out of the decriminalization of homosexuality, and with, with Lawrence the, v. Texas, right, with Lawrence v. Texas, and that really studied the standpoint of we are decriminalizing homosexuality. That's you know four years after DOMA was passed. Actually, no, more than that, seven years, six years after DOMA was passed. Mm -hmm. And uh, with all this other gay marriage bans and this sexuality backlash against Lawrence v. Texas, how close do you think we are to achieving this marriage equality? And do you think that you know Perry versus Schwarzenegger has a chance? of becoming the case, the loving versus Virginia? I can't say. I mean, I think it could if, if um, there are opportunities to rebuild the struggle around it. Um, I mean, right now the movement's pretty quiet. Again, I'll talk about that maybe tomorrow. But um, uh, I, I do think that there has been a tipping point already. I mean, that, that um, the, the contradiction of exclusion um, 
It has to fall sometime, but soon, I'd like to see it sooner rather than later. Lawrence v. Texas was one of those really weird court cases where I didn't see that coming at all. You know what I'm saying? Like that was one of the. That was one of the. That, that's like an exception to my rule, right? Like um, it just kind of <laughs> happens. Um, so I, but I can't. I can't say about Perry v. Schwarzenegger. What I was kind of get back to about equality and liberty, though, was about how I think postmodernism has a freedom problem, um, and that is to say that its politics of democracy are are articulated along that freedom line and not along the justice line, um, and that's. Um, so frustrating, um, and it actually then resonates, like I've said, with neoliberalism. So, Listen, have you heard of this? Uh, this where you've got to end, but I'm just curious if you've heard of this book by Joseph Schwartz, where he he's a political theorist. It's really heavily. I mean, it's interesting that he's a political theorist, but he relies heavily on political economy, and he's trying to reconcile. It's mostly a critique of postmodernism, but he's trying to reconcile a politics of difference with a politics of solidarity. Mm -hmm. In the, that's in the title somewhere, I forget the precise title. But it's a really interesting book because it combines all of that theory and political economy uh -huh. with this yeah. attempt to reconcile those two. Well, it's kind of like Judith, not Judith Butler, um, Nancy Frazier. Um, you know, in Justice Interrupted, she has that um, uh, sort of quadrant system where um, um, recognition and redistribution and reform and revolution are on a quadrant system, and you can have a revolutionary recognition, which is deconstruction, and revolutionary redistribution, which is socialism, and you can put de deconstruction and socialism together. I mean, I don't know if I totally buy it, but yeah, but there's a proliferation of differences alongside a redistributed. What is the name of that one? Justice Interruptus. Okay. Yeah, I know, it's kind of funny, but I, I really um, enjoy that book. People are like, whoa, I never, that's getting back to that question, like it's, um, who has posed the terms of the question? Like, you, you're silencing difference if you have a demand. No, why, I mean, <coughs> the frustration of life.